I sat down alongside of my good friend Nemecon, who had once been a great chief of the Chippewa people in his younger days. Now, at the age of 109, he told me of his father, Keokan. He told me how his father spoke of the land that we now sat upon. He told me how this land was sacred to his ancestors and had always provided shelter. Along with the great flowing river of food, there would never be need. He reminded me that those who now live on this land will always live besides the proud ancestors of the past, gaining from them their wisdom and guidance forever. Zephaniah Butts. Hi, I'm Chris Troy, producer of St. Clair County Risa's Moment in History video series. 59 years ago, at the age of one, I moved to the city of Marysville with my family. And for the next 17 years, I would attend Marysville schools, play in Marysville parks, and learn by living in the city of Marysville exactly what the word community meant. In 2024, the city of Marysville turned 100 years old, so I thought it would be a great time to take a look back on exactly where the city came from. Marysville was created out of an area that had been part of Canada, Quebec, and then after the Revolutionary War and the United States took over, it became the Northwest Territory, and then that was further divided into the states or territories that we, that we have today, Michigan, Wisconsin, Indiana, Illinois, Ohio, and the eastern part of Michigan, which Marysville is, was, was a piece of that. Real estate investors, entrepreneurs, I guess, from Detroit named uh, Meldrum and Park. They bought quite a bit of property south from Port Huron, south into St. almost to St. Clair. And those parcels of land then would be sold. These early settlers weren't necessarily the first European or American owners of that property. And some of those properties were purchased either from the government or in some cases from the, the native people that had claim to those areas. There's some evidence that very early on in the, right after the Revolutionary War, that a number of French Canadian entrepreneurs uh, came to Marysville and built a sawmill where Later on, Bunce would build his sawmill. After the War of 1812, that is when we started seeing more people coming in from other parts of the United States, whether that was Ohio or New York or New England. And in 1817, that is when Zephina Bunce came to Marysville, built his sawmill and a trading post where the, the former Detroit Edison plant was. He would trade with the Indians. A lot of his lumber was being shipped down to Detroit. He also dabbled, he, at one point he had a brickyard, and he was also politically involved. He was a territorial representative for the territory of Michigan. And later on, when Michigan became a state, uh, he became a judge. So he's somebody that had a lot of influence, and the area near where he lived was called Buntsville. Later, in the 1840s, Andrew Mack visited and decided this was a nice place. He was a sailor from Connecticut, went around the world a couple times, and he uh, moved to Ohio, uh, and then he got involved in politics there. He ran for mayor of Cincinnati, I believe, and that didn't work out, so he came up to Detroit, and he was appointed to a federal job, I think it was customs inspector in Detroit and he was also the militia here in Michigan, involved in the War of 1812. Eventually, as he got a little bit older, decided to, to move out into the country, out from the city of Detroit, and he settled former sawmill site in what is now the Marysville Golf Course, and that, that location became known as Max Place. He had a sawmill, farm, and orchard there. He had a trading post, and he also supplied a lot of firewood for the ships to power their, their steam engines. Along the river, the area where the city park is today, 
That was developed by Edward Vickery. And he came here, built a sawmill. It seems to be a pattern here. He was a postmaster at one time, and then eventually he moved away. All three of these settlers picked places where the water was falling, at least at some point. Bunce Creek, you can still see evidence of the creek. If you're going south on River Road, getting onto Gratiot to the right, you can see a low area, and that's the remnants of Bunce Creek. And that, at one time, went right under the, the power plant there and into the river. Max Place, the creek that at one time was called Meldum Creek, and then it was Max Creek, and then it was Carlton Creek, and then now it's called Cuddle Creek. In Vicksburg, or Vickery's Landing, there was a, a stream called Mud Creek. You can see where it was if, through the park. It kind of went back into the park and kind of curved around and then back to the north of the park. Vickery was probably one of the first to transition to steam power for his sawmills because that small creek would probably did not supply enough water to keep them working year round. When Andrew Mack died, the post office moved to Vicksburg. The, the business, the steamship stopping there, that kind of slows down. People are able to make the short little trip from areas right around what is today the golf course to Vicksburg, and kind of the same thing with, uh, with Bunce. I think a big part of these three, three communities coming together, uh, Buntsville, Vicksburg, and Max Place, was the increase of people and s supplies that were available It was in, in transportation. If we want to talk about downtown Vicksburg or downtown Marysville, you know, in most of the 1800s, it's going to be Long River Road from Boucher and Gratiot meet down to about the golf course or a little farther south and along Huron with that intersection of Huron and River Road being kind of the downtown area of Vicksburg. While the lumbering industry had been built up by Bunce, Mack, and Vickery, a new player would arrive in the area in 1863, and his name was Nelson Mills. He was born in Nova Scotia, came to Michigan, and lived in Newport, which is now Marine City, and worked as a spar maker. Spars are masts for ships. On a trip to Algonac in 1861, Nelson would meet Mary Geralds Williams. The two were married on March 23, 1863 and moved to Vicksburg, buying up the Vicksburg Mill, the mill in Buntsville, as well as Max Mill, making himself pretty much the sole owner of the lumber industry coming out of this area. Within just a few years, he would own a large general store in Vicksburg, leading him to become the Postmaster General. Along with his businesses growing, so was his family. Over the next few years of marriage, the two would have seven children. Along with Mary's father, Myron Williams, the mill's empire would build freighters, barges, as well as pleasure crafts in Vicksburg, invested in grain elevators, as well as owning interest in lumbering property in Tawas and Oscoda. By the time Mills would pass away, he was one of the richest men in the area, easily being a millionaire in early 1900 standards. Among his many business interests, Nelson Mills also had a little bit of a hand in railroads as well, and this came from um, 
Being basically the head of lumbering for much of the upper part of Southeast Michigan, he knew and ran in the circles of many of the investors in the Port Huron Northwestern Railway, including Daniel B. Harrington and William P. Sanborn. He had the power and the kind of influence that he could direct uh, the locations to which uh, the railroad would run, which included, quite frankly, some of the standing lumber that he had in different areas in the thumb. If a store owner was a postmaster, then that would draw customers into his store. In the case of Marysville, Bunce's post office moved to Port Huron, and Mac's place, the post office moved to Vicksburg. So Vicksburg was the name of the community, they were kind of joining together informally. The story goes that Nelson Mills ordered a piano for his wife, but was shipped to Vicksburg, the city of Vicksburg on the other side of the state. And apparently that was not uncommon. So what he, what he did was he changed the name of the community from Vicksburg to Marysville. Named it after his wife and I believe be one of his daughters. So that's where the name Marysville came from and that was kind of the identity for what is today Marysville. One of the things that really put Vicksburg on the map was this situation where it sort of sat along a waterway but also was within a short distance of other transportation modes. Uh, one of these transportation modes that ultimately played into Harold Wells even coming to the area was what is commonly known as the inner urban. This was built by the rapid railway coming out of the Detroit area. And it originally connected smaller electric operations, including the one in Port Huron. And as time goes on, people realize that the ability to generate power had multiple benefits. Uh, and for Marysville, this ultimately led to the possibility of Detroit Edison building the power plant here because there was already a natural electrical connection that had come in the construction of the rapid railway between Detroit and Port Huron. 1910s and early 1920s, there was still a large excess of electrical output that was out there. And so one of the many ways that they used this electrical power was for the transportation of people but also goods that often went between a lot of the local businesses in the area, allowing them direct access and speedy access to both Port Huron on the one end and Detroit on the other. And Marysville, of course, sits right in the middle of this. There's absolutely no doubt that that, again, helped influence the growth of industry in uh, the Marysville area. For most of the 19th century, lumber was a big business, but eventually that died out, slowed down. You know, it was harder to get the trees to Marysville. Most of the people in Marysville worked for the sawmills or related industries, and by, by 1900, the sawmill business was done. It was just you know, a few people, a few stores, a post office. So the next big change that came was C. Harold Wills, Child Harold Will C H I L D E. His mother was a fan of Lord Byron. He was named after a character in a book, but uh, Wills hated the name. He never used it. That's why you see it always written C Harold Wills. C Harold Wills was a brilliant engineer, born in 1878 in Indiana. 
He has a great interest in mechanical things. So he eventually gets together with Henry Ford, probably in the late part of 1900, and they become friends who have this common interest and goal of building an automobile. So when Henry Ford forms the company that we know today as Ford Motor Company in 1903, Harold Wills is hired on as the chief engineer. Though Henry Ford didn't really like uh, to name positions, to have people with titles, C. Harold Wills was really considered the chief engineer. The car that really puts Ford on the map is the Model T that comes out in 1908. And C. Harold Wills is a big part of making that car happen. He designs the planetary transmission. He's integral in creating vanadium steel for the car. He's a very important part of the early Ford Motor Company. So important that when he finally decides to leave in 1919, he receives $1.5 million, which is some pretty serious money in 1919, as a percentage of Henry Ford's profits. Henry Ford and C. Harold Wills were, were good friends. And in fact, Henry Ford was C. Harold Wills' best man at his wedding. He used to come up here to travel and hunt and so on. And he noticed these Canada geese they're very large, powerful, independent birds, and he thought that would be a good logo for him to use for his car. Wills changed this area because when the uh, area first was bought up, over 4,000 acres of it for Wills for his factory in the city, there may be 200 people here, and it was a very sleepy little town. So he drew a lot of people here to work in his factory. In fact, at one point, there were probably over 2,000 people here working in his factory. Today, there are almost 10,000. By 1919, he had made enough money, he decided he was going to go off on his own, so he got a big I guess, severance pay from Henry Ford and was going to use that money to build not only a car factory, but a community. a new record, Garwood must reach 100 miles an hour. Water is as hard as glass at that speed. An accident could be fatal. Disregarding danger, Wood opens the throttle. He's known as the Silver Fox because of his racing skill. And Miss America 9th is one of the fastest boats in the world. 102 miles an hour, a new record. The oldster is tops in a sport that demands the iron nerves of youth. The secret of his success, courage and self-confidence. Those qualities mark Garwood's career from the beginning. You really can't talk about Marysville in the 1920s, 1930s without talking about Garwood. Gar was born in 1880 in Iowa. He was one of 11 and the family ended up moving to Minnesota where his dad was a ferry boat captain. And I think one of his fondest memories or the first time he really liked racing was when he was a boy on the ship with his dad. There was two ferry boats on this lake. They went back and forth and occasionally they would race. Well, one day he's on the boat with his dad and they're getting beaten by the other ferry boat because they're running out of wood to fuel the engines. So his dad tells him to break up the chairs and the uh, tables and feed the fire and they end up winning the race by a hair and the passengers loved it and that was what got Gar into racing. So he grows up and he goes to school in Chicago and he starts knowing more about things than his professor so he goes into industry. He starts his own business and he's driving through town one day sees some guys dumping coal out of a wagon and at that time they had to use a hand crank to do this he thought he could develop something to make it a, the job a lot easier. He went to town on it. He developed the wood hydraulic lift. He patented it, and the rest is history. That thing went into every truck, every dump truck, every unloading vehicle at the time. And I think he had $50 million at that point. So the hydraulic lift was used in a lot of trucks and automobiles at that time. So that took him to Detroit. And in Detroit in 1916, he had just by happenstance heard that the Miss Detroit boat was up for auction because they needed to sell it to pay off the boat builders, Chris Smith and the family. He went there driving to Algonac same day, ended up buying the boat and talking to Chris and Jay, his sons, about the business. 
and they built a rapport together and that same day Garwood purchased the business from them and they went into business where Chris and Jay and the Smith boys were building race boats for Garwood for the next six years. So following the war, there was a surplus of Liberty airplane motors from the Packard plant. Well, Gar had the great idea of repurposing those for marine engines, and so he was able to secure 4,500 of these Liberty airplane engines at pennies on the dollar that he would then take to his company, repurpose them, and put them into these Garwood boats. They raced those boats. They made Miss Detroit two, and they won 1917 Gold Cup and the 1918 Gold Cup. They won six years in a row, and eventually the Eastern, the New York guys, got mad at him winning every year. And so they changed the rules on him. Said you couldn't use aircraft engines anymore to power these boats. And so he lost interest in it and went overseas to England and raced Miss America and beat the English and won glory for the United States overseas. So by 1927, the Algonac plant was at max capacity. They couldn't do much more there, so we started looking around for a new site. Marysville had the Willis St. Clair Auto Factory that had just shut down in 1927. So they, the city was looking for a way to bring in new industry, and Gar was aware of that. So he made it look like he wasn't too interested in it and ended up getting concessions from the city and loans from the city to build the factory there. And so by 1930, the factory opened. January of 1930, factory went into production. Unfortunately, three months earlier, 1929 stock market crash happened. So the boat building industry started to slow down. So the plant was set up to build at least 600 boats every year. It never really happened. The first year they got 193 built. And I think by 37, they made it up to 300, but they never really got its full potential at that plant. They actually, in 36, I believe, they switched over to building buses for a while. So for a couple years, they built buses out of that Marysville plant. It turned out that they ended up, they were competing with current customers of theirs, so they thought that wasn't a good idea. And by, I believe, 39, they were, they were out of that business. So things overseas were happening. The war in Europe was getting worse. And by December 41, the Japanese attacked Pearl Harbor and we were pulled into the war. So that January, the factory in Marysville was switched over to wartime production. Gar met with the army. They were looking for target boats so their guys could uh, practice shooting at a live moving target. The problem was, how do they do that without killing a guy for driving the boat. So Gar's ingenuity, he comes up with a pilotless boat that could stay on course and go 40 miles an hour. So he won the contract from the Army, produced those boats for them, and he ended up producing target boats, personnel boats, tow boats, all through the war. By 1945, they were awarded the Army-Navy Production Award, and the dignitaries came to Marysville. The Marysville High School marching band came down to the plant to play for them. It was a big to-do. And it was actually the last time that Gar addressed the company publicly um, because later that year he would end up selling his shares and retiring. He'd fly around the rest of his days and, and then live his rest of his days down in Florida. And he ended up passing away in 1971. Harold Wills was the owner of the Wills factory, built the Wills St. Clair. And he was kind of buddies with Walter P. Chrysler. Before Chrysler took over that building, Marysville used it as storage. I believe they put like their equipment, their fire trucks and stuff like that in that building. 
and that was used until Chrysler bought the building on August 22nd of 1935. And that was a banner year for Marysville because that building had sat virtually empty, but now it was going to be a major company coming in, and they were just happier than all get out to get it. Walter decided to buy the building and the property, because there was a lot of property and a lot of waterfront. From there, they put the addition on the, on the east side of the building, which gave them almost a million square feet between the two buildings, and got that going in 1936. The first plant manager was a guy, he had an engineering background. His name was Joe Fields, and he was there 13 years. He really formulated that whole process and how you ship parts. I think he was the guy that brought in PH&D Railroad. And back then, PH&D had a small fleet of cars that they would bring in. Now, in the 70s, we had 100 PH&D rail cars assigned to Marysville, and we would do 10 at a time, 10 per shift. So you would send them out to 10 different locations. They would pull them out, bring in the new ones, and the whole process would start the next day. The original Wills building was vacated and gave the Chrysler Marine Industrial an opportunity to move in there. And they were building everything from four-cylinder inboard motors to Hemi outboard motors. So it was quite a, quite a feat. There was a marine building right out on the water and it's right where the boat launches are today. And they used to test the boats, the motors, everything was done right out of that building. Remember, Marysville opened in 1936, and it became the first national parts distribution center. So it would supply parts to the 14 field parts distribution centers. Their main customers were those 14 PDCs. Now, if you remember, in the middle of all of this, the war came on. And when the war came on, they weren't building new cars. So the cars that were on the road had to be serviced. And when they were serviced, those parts came out of Marysville to the 14 field PDCs. Ultimately, Marysville became a supplier for the war effort doing uh, products for the Jeeps, the tanks. All of those parts were also part of that family of parts for Marysville. If you think about the parts coming in, they would come directly from the stamping plant. And it would just be a raw metal with oil to keep it from rusting. And then it would go into what they called a flow coat system. And that was a system where the parts were hung on an overhead conveyor and they went through a spray application. Then they would go into the ovens and the paint would be cured. Then they would pack them either in individual boxes or raw on racks and hold them until the 14 field depots would require replenishment. Now it was converted over into what they called an e-coat system. And that's an electro deposition where it's coated with electricity. You know, I, I think of Marysville quite often. It was a, a lot like a family atmosphere. And that's the kind of uh, stuff that you had. And, and I loved it. I loved it there. You know, when the early 20th century kind of came to Marysville, it really changed the outlook of everything. 
You had companies like Morton Salt, St. Clair Rubber Factory, Garwood, and of course, Will St. Clair. But you know, none of those would have been possible if it wasn't for the mighty Marysville, the Detroit Edison power plant. You talk about Wills and his factory, his plant, all the things he was doing. But the other thing that he was doing, he wasn't just bringing industry to the community, he was bringing community to the community. He was building countless streets full of houses and all of those houses had electricity. So that meant basically that the Detroit Edison needed to build a plant that would accommodate all these requirements needed. The construction of the Marysville power plant started in about 1914, and that was as a result of some thoughts that uh, Henry Ford would build a, an auto plant in the Marysville area, and there was a need for electricity to support the plant. And his plans kind of fell through, and a gentleman named Willis knew about the plan, and he started to build the, which I guess we know is the Chrysler plant, they bought the property, I believe, from the Bunce family, and I know they originally paid $14,000 for 600 feet of river frontage there. So construction started in 1914, and it took about eight years to complete construction of the low side power plant. And that was the six stacks that used to be at the plant site in 1922. They only had a small generator at the time. They started out with two 12 megawatt generators. There was a lot of firsts at Marysville. Marysville was the first power plant that had coal delivered by ship. The railroads in this area weren't that good at the time that they built the plant and some tugboat captain in, in Detroit said, I can deliver it by barge. So that's what they originally did. So it was the first plant to have coal delivered by water. In 1926, it was getting obvious that there just wasn't enough from the first two generators. There wasn't enough current being generated. So with the new city of Marysville, with the new industries, they decided to upgrade and bring two more units to the Edison plant. Low side and the high side at, at Marysville are two distinct plants. The low side was a technology of the, of the early 1900s where it had low pressure and uh, a wet steam. And the high side, which was built in the 40s, was high pressure and high temperature or superheated steam. By 1940s, early 40s, World War II started. And you started by this time having Chrysler now in the plant where Wills first started building military supplies. You had Gar Wood building military supplies. And you had St. Clair Rubber building military supplies. You also had Morton Salt stepping up their operations to provide salt for K rations. So providing quality power to all these outfits was really crucial for the war effort. Detroit Edison historically has had a, I would say, better than average um, understanding of their history and also a willingness to preserve or save that history. When 1923, which is really a giant period of growth for Detroit Edison as a whole, they put in an order for four uh, steam locomotives from the Baldwin Locomotive Company. You need to remember that at the same time Marysville was being built, Detroit Edison was also building uh, power plants in Trenton, uh, down near River Rouge area, and so again, all of these plants needed to have the ability to shift coal cars in and out and, and other products. Uh, and so uh, these engines were all built to a standard design. They were powerful in the sense that they could move things around, but uh, they were also kind of small, so they could fit in smaller areas and, and do uh, projects. And so those locomotives at each of their plants all were numbered in a 200 series. 
Uh, as anybody that goes into Marysville Park will know, their engine was a number 203, and it was actually uh, the third one out of the bunch uh, to arrive. So the locomotive shuttled uh, coal cars in and out of that plant uh, for basically 30 years. When the Detroit Edison began to look to switching to diesel locomotives in the late 1940s and early 1950s, um, Edison realized that this little engine kind of had a following, um, as it did in other communities as well, but in Marysville in particular, it was such a part of the landscape that there was a movement to save the locomotive. And so in this particular case, they worked with the city of Marysville to preserve the locomotive. Uh, in order to do that, they actually worked with the Port Huron and Detroit's section crew to build a temporary switch and trackage to basically run it right into the park where you see it today. The last bit of that is literally the track that the locomotive sits on. The engineering crew drove it in there for the last time and dumped the fires and as they say there she sat uh, and they pulled the track back and pulled the switch out and, and there it sat since uh, the late 1950s. I think some of Dad's proudest um, achievements as mayor, the biggest one and with the most historical impact is the DTE train in the park. He was mayor and when they brought the train in on the track and it seemed like the whole city of Marysville was in the park. And for that to be still standing today and have the memories that it has, I know that was a very, a very proud moment. He, did, he didn't know that at the time. You know, he had no idea the impact that that was going to have. When I came to the plant in 1978, the low side was already out of commission. It was decommissioned as a result of uh, environmental laws and uh, they needed to put precipitators on the stacks and that wasn't economical at the time with those units. The high side still uh, was in service when I was there and it, uh, it did run into the, I believe it was into the mid 80s. And then it got, uh, was shut down and went into its extended cold standby for a number of years. But it just became a time where the plant itself was obsolete. And uh, be it the equipment was obsolete, they didn't make parts for it anymore. Uh, technology moved on, so you got bigger machines, bigger turbines now that produce more power uh, with less people. There were automated systems. So, uh, it was just a uh, time for it to, uh, to go. Knowing all the people who worked there and all the care that was taken to build that building, when it was raised, it, it was kind of sad. And I know it was sad to a lot of people who really counted on Detroit Edison to put food on their table, to put their kids through school. Um, the Mighty Marysville was called the Mighty Marysville because it not only provided power, but it really provided a livelihood for the citizens of Marysville. While it seems it could take another hundred years to talk about all the amazing things that the city of Marysville has done through its first hundred years, from the dreamers becoming the Vikings, to new industry, to new opportunities for its residents, the city of Marysville will continue to push forward with pride, integrity, and looking to the future for new opportunities. For Moment in History Films, I'm Chris Troy, reminding you that history lives in all of us. Thanks for watching.